Hey guys, NES Complex here. In this episode of Nintendo Power Time Machine, we're gonna wax nostalgic about Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link, and Metal Gear. Plus, we meet the Gossip Gremlins and Bionic Freak Bots. It's all here in issue number four. Let's go! Flipping through an issue of Nintendo Power is like traveling through time. Nintendo's fascinating, nostalgic, and sometimes hilarious past is captured forever on its pages. Journey with me through time to discover Nintendo's history. In January and February 1989, moviegoers were introduced to The Three Fugitives and a couple of brainless, history-failing time travelers in Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. Meanwhile, Paula Abdul exploded on the scene with her hit single, Straight Up. The cover of issue number four was kind of boring. It's not horrible, but I've never been a fan of live actors on the cover of Nintendo Power. Especially this one, which portrays Link with a Bon Jovi-ish glowing mullet. Finally, the game everyone was waiting for. WrestleMania? Yikes. Finally, the game everyone was waiting for. Sesame Street? No, not that one either. Finally, the game everyone was waiting for. Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link. So apparently Princess Zelda knew the secret of the Triforce, but refused to tell a great sorcerer, and he made her fall asleep. Foretold in legends, a man of royal bearing would come to save Zelda and Hyrule, and his hand would show a mark. Well, what do you know, dearie? To overcome the evil forces, Link has to find the third piece of the Triforce because he already had wisdom and power, and he needs to find the Triforce of Courage. After a year and a half of waiting, Zelda fans finally got their sequel. Sort of. It's hard to deny that Zelda 2 is the black sheep of the franchise, but it was only the second game in the series, so while it certainly was different, it didn't seem out of place until Nintendo released A Link to the Past for the Super Nintendo, which solidified Zelda's norms. I personally love the game with all its magical, metallic shininess. The magic system, leveling up, the sword fighting mechanics, all the items and spells and enemy designs and side-scrolling dungeons were brilliant, but I never understood why the overworld looked so bad. Why didn't they just reuse the sprites from the first game for Link and the environments, and especially the enemies? Overall, Zelda 2 is a brilliant game and an amazing NES experience. The fold-out Zelda map is pretty cool, but the poster has that certain 80s odor. What on God's green earth was the artist drinking? Probably milk. Hmm. Skate or die. Grab your board and hit the concrete. Without the internet, 80s gamers had few options when facing a difficult challenge. You could either pound away at the problem, patiently exploring every option, you could ask around the playground for any tips your friends might have, or you could finally consult the wizened counselors of Nintendo Power. Some very nostalgic questions were answered, giving gamers the location of the warp zones in Super Mario Bros. 2, and how to beat level 7 in Zelda. The pros also answer how to navigate the base mazes in Golgo 13. This issue's classified information featured two little cheats that many of us still use today. The classic Konami code in Life Force, which gives players 30 lives for each of their four continues. And the special strategy in Mega Man 1 for defeating the rock monster in Monsteropolis. If you equip Elecman's weapon and repeatedly pause and unpause as the beam passes through the Yellow Devil's eye, it will register as a hit each time. Pretty snazzy. This issue also featured Marble Madness, a glorified version of the classic board-tilting marble rolling game Labyrinth. The game is pretty fun, with its isometric viewpoint and clever use of ramps, pipes, and all manner of miniature golf gimmicks but it's also pretty difficult. Issue number one had a spread dedicated to baseball games. This issue does the same thing, just with football. The Nintendo Power Bowl. And these are the ugliest cheerleaders I've ever seen. 
This one looks like Scott Bakula. It's interesting to compare Tech Mobile, John Elway's quarterback, and NFL football. Tech Mobile only has 12 teams and 4 selectable plays. John Elway's quarterback has 14 teams and 9 offensive and 6 defensive plays. And NFL football has all 28 of 1989's NFL teams and 36 available plays, but requires the rulebook to select them all. All that realism, and yet after 20 years, Tech Mobile, with all its arcadey simplicity, is still the most beloved game of them all. On page 74, the classic stealth game Metal Gear is highlighted. While Metal Gear actually originated on the MSX2 computer in Japan and Europe, this is the game that launched the Metal Gear franchise in the States. The idea of enemies seeing you and having to rely on stealth was so unique and ambitious, and the tension you feel when the enemies do see you is almost palpable. Plus, the inventory was loaded with cool weapons, key cards, and curious gadgets. As a side note, the box art, which is really cool, is a complete and undeniable lift from a picture of Kyle Reese from Terminator 1. I mean, look at this. This issue's video shorts is packed with games destined for bargain bins, mediocrity, and ridicule. Games like Friday the 13th, Othello, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and World Games. Some games were decent, like Bump and Jump, Qbert, and the Bomberman spin-off Robo Warrior, but overall, this set of games offered nothing to be excited about. Packwatch, on the other hand, forecasted three NES classics. Ninja Gaiden, with its fast-paced ninja action and cinema scenes. It's hot, hot, hot. The underrated gym, The Guardian Legend, with its Zelda-esque overhead view and vertical scrolling shoot-em-up sequences. TMNT is also mentioned, but was so early in development that Nintendo Power had no idea what it was going to be like. Listen to this. We hear it's similar in framework to Metal Gear, which suggests to us an overhead view showing lots of territory and equipment. <laughs> the editors also added the Gossip Gremlins to Packwatch, and honestly, I'm not sure what to think about them. I might have thought they were radical when I was 11, but now? The NES Journal section revealed the coolest arcade machine ever. Period. In my opinion the PlayChoice 10. Instead of buying lives, quarters dropped in the PlayChoice 10 bought you time. Time to play the hottest NES games, and similar to a jukebox, players got to choose from a menu of 10 games. Be on the lookout for PlayChoice. It's the only choice. The Soundwaves article on page 94 is a time machine unto itself. Debbie Gibson, Julian Lennon, and Huey Lewis and the News Gotta love that 80s fashion, though. Celebrity Profile, Karch Kirli. Who the heck is Karch Kirli? Oh, he was the captain of the gold medalist US volleyball team in 1988. Okay, time out. Look at this, tucked away at the bottom corner of page 95. The Nintendo serial system. This stuff was awesome. But this has got to be the worst location for an advertisement, after an article about Karch Kirli. I promised myself I wouldn't make any more cheap shots at the poor kids in the power player section, but sometimes I feel obligated. This is our best player, Daniel Megatron Lily. He has won Metroid seven times, Rygar, Kid Icarus, Double Dragon, Kung Fu, and Super Mario Brothers. In our club, he has reached the rank of Supreme Video Grid Warrior. We are proud. Signed, Brian Goatee Shazbot Video Grid Warrior First Class Bionic Freak Bots Video Club. Wow. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Stay tuned for episode 5 of Nintendo Power Time Machine featuring the classic action game Ninja Gaiden. 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 Thanks for watching.